This episode of Tape Facts is sponsored by Chemistry Man. Chemistry Man! What's the scene, Inspector? Chemistry Man, you've come just in time. Aliens have attacked the city. No, God, they're horrifying. Rawr. I'm an alien and stuff. If only we had some anti-alien cream. Nothing to fear, Inspector. I'll make some with the power of chemistry. Bless you, chemistry man. Sorry, is that fumo free? Yeah. Glasses and lab coat, yeah? Oh, yeah, yeah, sorry. Here you go, Inspector. One vial of anti-alien cream. You did it, Chemistry Man! This city is saved! Hi kids, Chemistry Man here. Make sure to stay in school, eat your vegetables, and remember, stay chemical. Right then, apologies for the delay. We'll try my best to keep them to a minimum. Been away from my drawing tablet for a while now, as a couple weeks ago I managed to sprain one of the muscles in my armpit, somehow. Still, could be worse. I've had plenty of time to rest up and I've just finished a course of naproxen, an anti-inflammatory my GP gave me to see off some of the swelling. At least I assume that was the reason, and she didn't accidentally diagnose me with gout or a bad case of menstrual cramps. Magnesium is the second of the alkaline earth metals, and I'm not being funny, but it must be chuffed to bits with itself. It's far and away the most commercially important of the group two elements, and out of every metal on the periodic table, it's only beaten by iron and aluminium in terms of how many millions of tons of it are produced on an industrial scale. As far as materials chemistry goes, magnesium exists in a sort of chemical gold lock zone. It's not too poisonous, it's not too radioactive, and it won't break into your house and steal your family's breakfast. Magnesium alloys are usually incredibly strong with regards to their weight, on account of pure magnesium being one of the lightest metals on the periodic table. Magnesium can also be alloyed with an enormous variety of other elements, and if you get the balance right, you can make materials that are both very strong and resistant to corrosion. Pure magnesium, meanwhile, is used much more sparingly in industry, due to how dangerous it can be to store and transport. If you heat a strip of magnesium metal in a Bunsen burner, it will violently react with oxygen in the air, in a blinding white fireball and I mean literally blinding. This reaction, producing magnesium oxide, is highly exothermic and can raise the immediate surroundings to temperatures as high as 3100 degrees Celsius. Now, our little monkey brains aren't exactly great at visualising big numbers, so let me explain how hot this is. If you take a lump of purified gold and steadily raise the temperature, it will start to melt at 1064 degrees Celsius. By the time you reach 3100, the gold will have boiled, starting at 3080 degrees Celsius. Due to heat and chemical sensitivity, magnesium fires are incredibly difficult to put out if they go out of control. Small fires from metals like magnesium or sodium can be treated with a dry powder fire extinguisher, which in most countries have blue labels on their sides. But if the fire manages to spread, or doesn't go away after 30 seconds of continuous spray, call the fire brigade and make sure your shoes are on because you're going to run like an Olympic sprinter with a bad case of the galloping trot. What you should not do, boys and girls, is throw water on it, because when you die in the ensuing explosion, your chemistry teacher will be having a few short words with you at your funeral. Exposing a magnesium fire to water is possibly one of the stupidest things you can do in a chemistry lab, say for washing your eyes out with bleach or topping up your asthma inhaler with sarin gas. Under normal conditions, magnesium slowly reacts with water in the air to produce a layer of magnesium hydroxide and hydrogen gas. At room temperature, this reaction is too gentle to do any real harm, but at 3000 degrees, it becomes a recipe for unmitigated disaster. At such high temperatures, the hydrogen produced from this reaction will explode outwards in a fireball of scalding steam, showering everyone in the vicinity with lumps of molten metal and the charred, pulpy remnants of your arms, legs, and face. Magnesium compounds are also vital important in living organisms. One example of this is chlorophyll, a family of green pigments that lets plants and algae absorb sunlight for photosynthesis. But humans, being much less cool than plants, have to eat food instead of absorbing sunlight. You know, like losers. Magnesium is an essential mineral in humans, and low concentrations can lead to muscle cramps, headaches, and about five million other unpleasant things. The humble avocado is something of a poster child for magnesium-rich foods, in the same way that bananas are often associated with potassium. But you can also reach the recommended levels of magnesium in your diet by supplementing it with other things. In particular, leafy greens like spinach and kale. Nice to know if, like me, you think that avocado has a texture like baby food made from mushed up caterpillars. Among the earliest magnesium compounds used by humans were Epsom salts, otherwise known as magnesium sulfate heptahydrate. Can't imagine why that name never took off. In the 17th century, a farmer from the sleepy village of Epsom, Surrey, noticed his cows refused to drink from a spring, which due to high levels of magnesium tasted bitter and salty. Intrigued, the farmer
farmer rubbed some of the water on a rash on his skin, and he saw it miraculously started to heal, and it wasn't long before word began to spread. In 1697, the English scientist Nehemiah Grew wrote a short Latin pamphlet on the extraction of purging salts from the spring. Grew noticed that the salts from the spring could be rubbed over minor wounds to help scabs form. But while this evidence was promising, Grew presented Epsom salt as nothing short of a miracle cure-all, claiming they could be used to treat practically every condition and affliction known to man. Loss of appetite, jaundice, headaches, vertigo, rheumatism, kidney stones, worms... He said a lot of things, okay? Grew was hopelessly wrong about most of these applications, but that didn't stop people from buying into the hype. The year after his pamphlet was published, he was granted a royal patent to produce Epsom salts in the UK. Not really sure what a royal patent would look like these days. Probably a lot like a normal patent, to be honest. But I don't know, maybe the Queen gives you a voucher for Pizza Express. Now, you could say that Grew's pamphlet was a little overstated, in the same way you could call Jeffrey Dahmer a little bit eccentric. Though it cornered the market in treating the rashes of 17th century farmers, Epsom salts are now mostly sold over the counter for minor things, primarily magnesium deficiencies, extracting splinters, and bath salts for little old ladies. And while magnesium chemistry is yet to present us with a pathway to medical immortality, I'm sure its compounds will be greatly appreciated by generations of 98 year olds to come. And right, that's another element ticked off the list. Big thank you to State of the World for doing a bit of voice work, check them out if you're not sending stuff. Two weeks ago, I entered the Veritasium Science Communication Contest. Pretty simple idea, you explain a counterintuitive scientific concept in 60 seconds or less. The top three entries get some cash, as well as exposure on one of the biggest science channels on YouTube. Now, there are much bigger channels entering this contest than little old me, but we're in with a chance. I've linked my entry in the description. If you have a minute to spare, or well, 55 seconds, please consider giving it a watch. Right, like and subscribe, see you next video. Hopefully won't have injured any other stupid parts of my body by then, like my tongue or my nostril, or that one dying brain cell that keeps holding out hope the new Pokemon games will be any good.